Yeah, I, I guess I just have a few piecemeal things to say. Um, the first is I'm, I'm not discounting the role of kinship and other variables uh, in you know the social cohesion and, and social pressures that get people to do uh, uh, terrifically unwise things. Um, and the problem for me is not, uh, I'm not worried about the bad people in the world. I'm not worried about the, the sociopaths who have frontal lobe anomalies and can't feel empathy for others and therefore, you know, kill and eat people. Um, there are people like Jeffrey Dahmer in the world and, you know, belief is not necessarily what is so operative. What, what, what scares me the most about certain kinds of divisive dogmatisms, and I think religion being the, the preeminent flavor of that, uh, and at this moment in its history, Islam being the, the uh, most exquisitely uh, pungent of those flavors, uh, is that it, it, it takes, it enables perfectly sane, perfectly rational people uh, people who are not suffering obvious psychopathology, people who are not suffering uh, the kinds of oppressions that would lead any, you know, uh, anyone else to, to misbehave terribly, uh, to fly planes into buildings um, and to, to seek to get nuclear weapons so that they can blow themselves up in, in certain circumstances. And what I hear Scott doing is discounting the role of specific beliefs um, and I think specific, I think it really matters specifically what people believe and that th there are innumerable instances where we can see that the proximate cause of certain behavior is precisely what a person believed, in, in this case about God and paradise and, and, the, and the evils of infidels. And uh, so one thing I would say to you, Scott, is that uh, you have some, ex if, if Islam is really orthogonal to this problem, uh, or a, a you know variable number ten on your list of variables. Um, a few things you should explain. One is where are the Palestinian Christian suicide bombers? You know they, there are most of the Palestinians are Muslims, obviously, but there are Palestinian Christians who have to go through the same checkpoints. They suffer the same humiliations by Israelis. I mean, it seems to me this is practically a science experiment. We have the same people speaking the same language, living in the same deplorable conditions. One group uh, rather reliably forms a death cult, and the other doesn't. Um, and I th and a another example I'd like to put on the table, where are the, the Tibetan Buddhist suicide bombers? If oppression were enough to so derange a culture that they would blow themselves up on school buses, and, and where you could get crowds by the tens of thousands calling for the deaths of non-combatants, we would see Tibetan Buddhists blowing themselves up on Chinese school buses. And uh, what we don't see, we don't see that. What we do see among Tibetan Buddhists, uh, and there are many examples of this, we see Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns who have been tortured in Chinese prisons for decades, but really tortured, you know, with cattle prods and you know, electric shock to the genitals, coming out of, of these decades of torture, saying things like, my greatest fear while I was in prison was that I would lose my sense of compassion for my torturers. Uh, now I submit to you, given that, that that behavior, we might we might think it's pathological on some level to have that kind of compassion, uh, but that behavior is fully explicable in terms of the ideology of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, its emphasis on compassion, its view of, of, of uh, torturing as a, an expression of a person's ignorance within a context of rebirth. I mean, it, it is anchored by a certain kind of worldview. And I would say to you that given what Muslims believe, uh, you will never find a Muslim coming out of decades of torture in an in Israeli prison, prison uh, who will speak in those terms at all. Uh, and uh, so that's, you know, you can react to those two examples. And Yeah, good empirical claims. False. Yeah. Um, could I just have one slide? One slide. Oh, this is your, the, the handout that's outside, the, the mysterious handout. Um, I don't know if... This is a uh, study by a colleague of mine who works with me on... Could you, you have this? This is a study, this is a study uh, by a colleague of mine 
who works with me on the evolution of religion. Uh, he is a logistic re uh, regression looking at the odds of scapegoating, which is highly correlated with dogmatism and flexibility of belief mm -hmm. and commitment to violence among 10,000 people in over 10,000 people in 10 countries around the world. And so you have Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, other uh, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, non-religious is atheists and agnostics and others. Okay, this is the odds of scapegoating for people who believe there is only one God and it's my God versus people who believe in God as a supernatural entity, okay? Uh, or people who believe that there is no difference. What we've got is uh, in terms of, no, I'm not going to show the rest of them. What we got is exclusivity, that is a tendency to scapegoating, is highest for Catholics, um, Orthodox, and atheists. Okay? It is lowest for Buddhists, Hindus, uh, Muslims. Okay, that's the only empirical evidence I know about sort of intrinsic uh, notions, which is a large sample size of uh, scapegoating. And it's, as I said, it's virtually identical for violence and inflexibility of belief. Now, with respect to um, Palestinians, Palest oh, Buddhists, right? Mm. Well, you know, Buddhists, there were Japanese Buddhists who were kamikaze, yeah. of course. And uh, the Sri Lankan army uh, actually is threatening to do suicide squads against the Tamil Tigers who are Hindu uh, suicide squads. As far as the Palestinians are concerned, uh, you get about 70% support, depending on the threat perception at the moment. The survey's done. The surveys are done mostly by Khalil Shikaki of the Palestinian Center, for, Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in Ramallah. You get about 70% in a random um, sample uh, among Christians for uh, support for suicide terrorism, depending on threat perception. Now, the reason there aren't almost none, although Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades does allow Christians, uh, the reason that... Have there been Christian suicide bombers? No. Okay. The, the reason that there isn't is because the particular groups that are formed um, are... Actually, there have been PFLP suicide bombers. Palestinian uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. There have been um, several, six cases, I believe. There's a mostly Christian Marxist organization. The reason they have suicide bombers is very simple. And the reason Al-Qaeda has it is very simple. Um, suicide bombing, especially by Hamas operatives and Al-Qaeda operatives, are by the, their best and brightest. That is, the majority of suicide bombers are college educated, fairly well off relative to the surrounding populations, no desperation, poverty, uh, no criminal backgrounds, no insanity, no suicidal tendencies. And the organizations make a very costly commitment, a sort of Zahavi handicapping principle, to use their best and their brightest to get the community to trust them and, co and um, increase their political market share. And they've been so unbelievably successful that the PFLP, which is a secular Marxist organization, the DFLP, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, if you go to their websites, they're indistinguishable now from the Hamas. That is, you get incantations, almost Quranic. They're not Quranic, but they use the same words uh, for, for sacrifice. Um, and Al-Qaeda, the, the success of suicide bombing uh, by Al-Qaeda is a very contingent affair very similar to, to the Nazis, okay? There's a marvelous book called 30 Days. It's about Hitler's rise to power, to power in January 1933. On January 1st, the major newspapers in Germany declared Hitler's party dead. He had lost two successive elections. By the end of the month, he's chancellor of Germany through an unbelievably improbable event, set of events that no one would have predicted. And that takes over the fascist movement. Basically, it becomes the paragon of fascism around the world. Bin Laden, the same thing. He was one of about 40 Mujahideen commanders. And he got this bright idea basically from a combination of the Hezbollah and the Tamil Tigers. 
used it effectively, created unbelievable theater. And that theater was inordinately successful at, mo again, it was a media-driven political awakening, at mobilizing consciousness among a vast number of people. And Islam had this characteristic. It is a messianic religion, like Christianity, like all the monotheisms, and like all the isms, communism, anarchism, all the secular versions of Christianity. And it is a multi-state it, it multi system. And in the sort of advance of a unipolar United States power, it was seen by many people, this theater, this successful theater, as empowering these non-state actors. And so it became widely popular, so even bin Laden's enemies joined him and called themselves Al-Qaeda. But by the way, Al-Qaeda was never in common use until the United States put the word out there in the Southern District Court of New York in 1990 for the bombing of the uh, African embassies, when just like in the Joe Valachi trial, the prosecutor asked Jamal al-Fadl, do you know of Al-Qaeda? He says, well, it's a list. And who's on this list? Well, it was a list we made up in Afghanistan to track the Mujahideen. So Al-Qaeda is this organization by bin Laden. And what else does Al-Qaeda do? And by the time the end of the transcript is finished, Al-Qaeda becomes a concept that everybody's talking about. It's publicized around the world, and it's the first concept out there uh, at 9-11. And some, suddenly, everybody's Al-Qaeda. But if you go to Guantanamo and you ask yeah, the people, yeah. are they Al-Qaeda, they say no. So, let me just, can I just address some of, some of the things you brought up? Because I, I agree that affiliation with Al-Qaeda is a red herring. And this is an ideology that spreads, as you pointed out, it's, it's massively enabled by the internet. And uh, whether, whether someone has ever spoken to Osama bin Laden or has ever received an email from Al-Qaeda, they can be operating under the same ideology. Uh, I'm not sure how much of what you said has addressed my, my central concern. I will fully concede that there are other ways to think yourself into suicidal terrorism. Uh, I did not know there were any Christian suicide bombers, and it doesn't surprise me, but the, the, the thing that, that I want to point out is that there is a, there's a real difference between how easily you can, you can morph the ideology of, of martyrdom and jihad within, within Islam to this kind of behavior and how much more work you have to do in Christianity as it is currently practiced, and in Buddhism. Now, you mentioned the Zen Buddhists, the kamikaze pilots of uh, uh, World War II. I can, I can easily describe why Zen Buddhism, in, the, in combination with Shinto and Japanese military chauvinism, could get you an ideology that was very martial and justify that behavior, and why the Tibetan Buddhists are a very unlikely candidate population for that behavior, given what they believe about compassion, you know, among Buddhists, one of the real problems with Zen is that it does not emphasize compassion at all and get, or very much, and you can get this uh, very kind of militant samurai sort of, uh, you know, the sword of wisdom kind of ethos and uh, without much uh, practical application of compassion. So there, I'm still arguing for theological consequences uh, of ideas, and um, I just think that it's, there's an obscuritism at the heart of of the way you're talking about this that, that troubles me because I, this is what I think. If the Quran was exactly the way it is, but it contained a, a single extra line, and that line read, um, if you see a, a red-haired woman on your doorstep at uh, sunset, cut her head off. Okay, just imagine a text like this that comes down through the ages that, that contains a line like that. I can tell you what kind of world we would live in. We would live in a world where red-haired women would be found murdered in the Muslim world. We would, you know, we'd open the New York Times and we would hear that there were, you know, 20 heads found in a bag and they were all red-haired women. Um, and uh, we would also live in a world in which apologists for Islam would say, would, would look at that behavior and say, that has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, there was a, a new story uh, yesterday about a, uh, a Mormon man who killed his wife, and she had red hair. Uh, many of those women who were found in the, you know, whose heads were found in the bag in Baghdad were not actually uh, redheads, but the, some were strawberry blonde. Uh, uh, we would hear about uh, you know, women who were shot and not decapitated, and decapitation is the only thing that is sanctioned in the Quran. I mean, this is the kind of gymnastics 
we would be faced with. Um, and and the, the basic fact about the Quran, as it is with so many other books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and, and uh, there's nothing worse than Leviticus and Deuteronomy as far as I can tell, uh, but people ignore them, as Richard pointed out. The basic problem with the Quran is that it really does preach hatred and fear of the infidel far more eloquently than it preaches anything else. Uh, and that is a problem we are living with, and, and no amount of casuistry uh, is going to get us around that until we find some way of empowering the forces of moderation uh, in the Muslim world. And I would agree with you, in a hostage negotiation, you don't tell them that your religion is bullshit. Uh, I think we are engaged in a very different hostage negotiation now, talking about the role of science and intellectual honesty. Let me just say about the kamikaze, there's a book called When Cherry Blossoms Fall. They were not militant, there was not much of a militant ideology, they were basically German romantics. Read, read Zen at War and Zen War Stories. If this, you is know. Yeah. Okay. this is their diaries. This is their diaries. On the kamikazes for a moment, just because yeah. it's right, it's in the moment. And, and I know my esteemed colleague here, I always, he's always trying to it's okay. go hand to you in just a moment. <laughs> um, aren't we forgetting a couple, a, a couple of things here? That, for example, the American admirals in the Pacific, um, once they saw that Japanese pilots were instead of firing missiles and bombs to the ships, started flying their planes into the ships, they knew that there was a turn in the war at that point because as effective as that was as an act of war, they knew that Japan's capacity to wage war was on a dramatic decline because had that been, um, it was not the first choice for Japan to engage kamikaze bombers. And so if we go to Islam, there's a question I haven't heard asked yet mm. because we're looking at suicide bombings as some kind of in intrinsically noble exercise within the paradigm and abhorrent from the outside. But would there be suicide bombings if the Islamic community had their own air force and tanks? It, I, I don't think so. They would be invoking the military machines that the rest of the West has available to itself. And they say so quite specifically. Okay. No, I, I, no, I would say uh, I wouldn't be quite that sanguine. There wouldn't be suicide bombings perhaps. But this notion of martyrdom, either you believe in martyrdom as a genuine metaphysical principle or you don't. If you do, it has certain behavioral and logical consequences. We have, forget, get the U.S. out of this. Look at the war between Iran and Iraq. The Iranian mothers were sending their teenage sons out to clear minefields with their lives, uh, thinking they were going to get to paradise and get the whole family in after them. We were not, uh, this was not, Iran against the great Satan. This was not an expression of, of, of uh, their entanglement with Israel. This was, I mean, how do you get a, a mother to celebrate the suicidal atrocities of her children? She has to believe something. Now, more often than not, you know, I'm with Weinberg who thinks they ha she has to believe something religious. Now, you can get me some kind of Marxist uh, ideology hammered into her head that may get her to, to feel consoled by that behavior, but you know, martyrdom is good enough, and martyrdom is very well subscribed. And so whether they're, they're, they're willing to blow up nukes or, or, just, or just not be you know, deterred in a mutually assured destructive sort of way, the way the Soviet Union was, um, that's really what I'm worried about. I'm worried about a world in which we wake up and we see the psychological equivalents of the 19 hijackers armed with long-range nuclear weapons. And then we have to think, well, are these really rational actors? I mean, are they as pragmatic as Scott says? Or are these guys really willing to hit the wall at 400 miles an hour? I think they're telling us they're willing to hit the wall. Many of them are hitting the wall. I think as a rhetorical device, that's pretty persuasive. Uh, so I'm inclined to take them seriously. Yeah, I, okay, I want to step back a little bit for the debate that you, that you started earlier with your question to, to Sam to some extent. Um, and actually something you said, Sam, now allows you to bring it back, which is, I'm kind of amused. The basic point that you make very cogently is that we have this unusual and un, totally non-rational acceptance of religious sensibility, especially when those sensibilities are, are ludicrous. Mm. And, and, and the, the, the easy example is, is in, in this case, maybe Islam, as, uh, or you, you can pick whatever, or the Old Testament. But you're much more 
um, tolerant in your statement. Of course, of Buddhism. You talked about the, the Buddhists who, who, who had this compassion, but the compassion was based on nonsense. It's based on reincarnation. Well, it's, but, it's but, actually, but, I, mean, I can unpack that, but... Yeah, but, yeah. but okay, but the point is it's clear to me that you're much more willing to, in some sense, be um, respectful of a nonsensical religious belief which, is, which leads to a positive result, perhaps. And, and, yeah, I know, I want you to comment on that. I'm sure you'll not agree with that statement, but I want you to elaborate on it. But, but, but I think what, what that reflects is this question that you were asking earlier, which is the a priori um, attack on, on religious faith in general, or in fact, not religious faith, but, the, but faith in things which you cannot, which, for which you have no evidence whatsoever, as a general statement that that is a bad thing, that making that attack is, is, is uh, perhaps not uh, empirically advised, nor is, it, nor is it sensible to do. And I, and I have to say, as an empirical fact, I, I've evolved in my, in, my, in my own discussions. If I talked here five years ago, it would have sounded much more uh, like Steve or you or, or Richard, perhaps, in debating people on, on, on the issue of evolution around the country, I suddenly got hit with realizing how offensive how, and, and how illogical the statements that, that were being applied from what I was saying was, was, was being received by, by the people I was talking to. In particular, I remember debating, I forget the guy's name, who's head of the Intelligent Design Network in Kansas. The old fella, he's a nice old guy. Do you know, remember his name? Anyway, um, and he trotted out this letter from 50 Nobel laureates trying to defend evolution. They said, there's no evidence for design and purpose in the universe. And then the next sentence says, there is no design and purpose in the universe. And he said, see, these people are trying to preach atheism. And I thought, that, that's the worst thing they can be doing because, in fact, that has nothing to do with evolution because evolution has nothing to do with the design and purpose of the universe. It has to do with the development of diversity of species on Earth through natural selection. And so that, so that by going out and immediately attacking the notion that believing things without any evidence is empirically bad or, or is, is, just, is, just, is just not acceptable, uh, that we are stepping beyond our role as, as, as scientists and, and inevitably it becomes emotional. You, you don't mind, you wouldn't preach as much against Buddhism as you would against Islam because you don't like you like, like Islam less than you like Buddhism, and no, so. You're right. Well, so anyway, those are the things I, want, I wanted to provoke both of you. But I think sort of it's a way to bridge between the two of you. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, uh, good question. Uh, it's not that I'm pulling any punches uh, uh, from Buddhism based on some kind of dogmatic affinity with Buddhists or, or having been raised Buddhist. I mean, this is not uh, what's going on. I happen to think that within Buddhism, there's an extraordinarily nuanced and interesting methodology for meditation and some very sophisticated uh, discussion of the nature of consciousness, the possibilities of transforming our, our moment to moment perception of the world that, that link up r rather nicely with what we understand about neuroplasticity and, and the human brain at this moment. Um, if you sit in a room with the Dalai Lama talking to physicists and neuroscientists, you'll see that there is a, uh, for the most part, a very open and unconstrained dialogue going on. But the basic and, premise is nonsense, right? Reincarnation. Well, well, reincarnation who knows? That may, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have no, well, no, who knows in the sense that there's no, I mean, there are these spooky stories where, you know, a kid, I, I, I am not, okay. Okay. Well, the, the, re, 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 reincarnation, uh, it, the, you are on firm ground being skeptical of reincarnation. Let me say that, okay? Um, I mean, this is, this is going to take us far afield. I, I have published a few spooky things about telepathy and reincarnation which amount to not an endorsement of, of these beliefs, but just, you know, I hear there's all this data. Somebody, someone like Dean Radin writes a book about it. Brian Josephson, a Nobel laureate in physics, blurbs it. Okay. I don't have the time to do the meta-analyses or the statistical e expertise, so, so let's, I'm, I'm awaiting the evidence, okay? So I, I don't want to talk about reincarnation. It, it may be... Life after death experience. All right. No, let me answer the, the root of your question, which is, it really matters what the consequences of these dogmas are. I mean, it's not that all dogma is equally pernicious. And, and the problem with dogma is that there's no, I mean, you can't necessarily predict just how many lives uh, are, are, it's going to cost. And so you, you take one like this idea that the, the soul enters the zygote at the moment of conception. You know, life starts at the moment of conception. 
this sounds totally benign. In fact, life-affirming. Why not believe this, right? Then we invent something called stem cell research, and we have a president who vetoes federal funding of it because he and millions of other Christians think that, that every three-day-old human embryo uh, has a soul which cannot, uh, has interests which cannot be trumped by the interests of a little girl with full body burns or spinal cord injury or diabetes. And we seem to be at a stalemate in our ethical debate in this culture. And unless we are willing to criticize the dogma at that point, we really are left in a situation where tens of millions of people have conditions that could be remediated potentially by stem cell research or for which stem cell research is the best uh, game in town uh, as far as generating therapies. And we are not pursuing it aggressively. Um, so this is, this is where dogma begins to be really troubling. And if, if a reincarnation, if certainty, certainty about reincarnation were doing work that I could see anywhere that was an, analogous to the work of martyrdom, I would be telling the Buddhists, you have, I mean, this is, this is uh, until you had evidence, uh, this is pernicious nonsense. This is getting a lot of people killed. Now, it, there are situations in which it may get people killed. I can f fully uh, predict what those situations might be, or at least venture a guess. But the, the prob that's not the problem I'm seeing with Buddhists now. The problem I'm seeing with Buddhists is they, they are entangled with a lot of New Age mumbo-jumbo that, that makes, makes their discourse basically seem unscientific. Well, it seems to me, ultimately, hey, I want to take my, my microphone, but one last thing. <laughs> uh, uh, you need a microphone. Okay, one thing. Yeah, but it's not going to go anywhere. Oh. Roger, I have, to take, I have to go to the airport. Can I just make one statement? Yes. Okay. Just want to leave you with one thought. I agree there's lots of nonsense in the world and that science may or may not, though I see no historical evidence that there's any interesting thing science has done for morals yet or ethics or politics or anything else. In fact, I've seen the contrary, but let's suppose there is. And let's suppose that it's a good mission to get rid of the nonsense in the world. This is the problem which you're not facing. How to advance science and reason in a fundamentally irrational world not to wish it to go away, not to believe that by rational argument it will go away, but how to deal with that problem. It is a very, very hard problem. I got to go. Thank you, Scott. Well, I'm um, going to respond to you as you walk out as well. Yeah. Well, can I just say can I just say one thing, Roger? Because in response to those applause. Well, apparently, according to the people up there, your microphone is trumping mine at the moment. Okay. So All right. I'm going to use my advantage. Uh, Rational argument actually does occasionally, uh, I think rather often, change people's minds about God. I mean, I, I am the recipient of thousands upon thousands of emails now uh, from people who used to be fundamentalists who, who got argued out of it. I mean, the, 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 the trying to square their ludicrous beliefs about the world with the consequences of those beliefs and with the, with the testimony of rationality on a hundred fronts has eroded their confidence in those beliefs. And you, know, you wouldn't know this. I mean, we have this kind of shibboleth which says you can't, what, what, was, what, what wasn't reasoned into existence can't be reasoned out. The, the truth, I think, is rather much closer to, the, to this, that people are making desperate efforts, rather heroic efforts, every day of their lives to be reasonable, to, to have a coherent worldview. And when those efforts become too costly or too embarrassing, they, you know, dogma loses. And, and I, I can just tell you that there are, there are ministers in, in this country preaching to flocks, ministers who have completely lost their belief but can't figure out what other job to do. And so we're just literally getting up on Sundays, uh, espousing what they now know to be nonsense. Um, and uh, there's every permutation of that. There are fundamentalists who become moderates, moderates who become atheists. Uh, and so it's, it's just not true that people can't be argued out of their beliefs.